author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and I'm here at Third Place Books in Lake Forest Park with William Landay, author of Defending Jacob. William, welcome to Author. Well, thank you for having me. Well, let's start, uh, Bill, with your, your connection to storytelling. You have, do you still have a career going as a, as a, a lawyer? Are you still a prosecutor, or have you retired from that? I, I've retired from that. I was a, uh, an assistant DA for most of the 1990s. And I was actually writing while I was an assistant DA. So the, the idea of being a writer must have been living in you from very early on. This can't have just come yeah. about just when you started trying to no. prosecute criminals. I remember when I was in law school, a, a buddy of mine and I read Lonesome Dove. Yeah, and yeah. as we were reading it together, we were thinking, you know, when you're a lawyer, you don't really create anything. You don't create anything lasting. No matter how well you try a case, when you walk out of that courtroom, it's gone. And here, here was this beautiful book, and if Larry McMurtry had walked out and got hit by a bus that day, here was this creation that would live for 100 yeah. years after him. And we would say to each other, isn't this more of a lasting creation? So that was, that was kind of a, something that reawakened the, the interest in me. And so I started fooling around with it. And when I turned 30, I set out to write a book, one publishable book. I never said... I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to be a novelist. I don't think it even crossed my mind that, that I either had the talent or that, the, um, that you could support yourself that way. Uh, yeah. I came from, there were no writers or artists of any kind in my background, and it just wasn't something that people did. Yeah, that's something a lot of writers have to deal with because very few writers come from families where there's a writer in the family or that they know somebody. Mm -hmm. It's always these other people, isn't it? Isn't that one of the first... Hurdles you have to thing. cross. Like I yes. can do uh, me. I could be one of those people. Because where are they? They're yep. dead. A lot of the ones that you. Where reading. are they? And it's so it's presumptuous, you know, <laughs> to think it's presumptuous to think. Oh, what I have to say is meaningful enough yes. that I can demand people's time, uh, and it's also a leap of faith just to think, you know, maybe I do have the talent to do this, and the only way to find out is to try it, and in my case. I tried it and tried it and tried it, and you know I think I was just too stubborn to admit defeat. Yeah. So I kept uh, kept writing, and wrote several manuscripts that were uh, <laughs> artistically. This dubious. is the story, <laughs> though. But you, you got to go to school for it somehow, right? It's true. It's true. Right. It's true. I went to the school of uh, try and fail, try and fail. But if that's really what most writers do, you can go to an MFA program, which mm -hmm. is fine. But yeah. There's nothing like writing one book and another book and another book. I think that's true, especially if you, if you believe in yourself and if you believe in the tone of your writing and in the, you know, in the voice of what you're after. I almost feel like going to a class or being in reading groups is a little dangerous because it's static around the signal. It makes it harder to hear what you're trying to get at. You can't do this unless you absolutely want to do it and there's little else you'd want to do. Yes. And there's some crossover some yeah. people can do, but for the most part, it has to be kind of a compulsion, I think. Yeah, I agree. It has to be a passion for the simple reason that it's, it's damn hard. It's and it's hard not work. like everything else, because you can be a lawyer and not love being a lawyer. Right. And you and can make a lot make of money up. at it and yep. blah, 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 but not as a writer. Right. I think if, you're, if you are not driven to do this, if, you, if it's not... I wouldn't say a calling, but if it's not a passion, you can produce books, but they're going to feel flat and lifeless. Yeah. You have to, your heart and soul has to be in it so that it feels alive. You know, the thing that's interesting about books to me is, unlike other art forms, it's not a finished product. When you open a book, it's a bunch of squiggly lines on three or four hundred pages. It's up to the reader to animate that story and to activate it. And if the prose is flat. If there's not energy built into that writing, then it's just not going to happen. And we've all had that experience of picking up a book and laboring through it, and it just never comes to life. Yeah. And we've also had those magical reading experiences where it's electric, you know, where you do pull that story up and you're in it. Yes. So it, it's really, 
it's really a special medium. It, it is because I think almost more than any other that I can think of, and I love all the arts for different reasons. I love music. I really yes. love music. I yeah. love theater. But there's an intimacy with writing because you, the reader, are creating. Not only do you create it yourself, but you enter the, the, the thought stream of the characters yes. and of the writer. It's a very intimate connection that you feel, which is why you'll very often meet readers or readers will email you and <laughs> they feel connected to you. Yeah. It, and it, it's also funny because, you know, there's a time disconnect. You can write a book in... You know, it sits on the shelf yeah. for 10 years. When they pick it up and they activate that story for themselves, that's the moment that that story lives for them. And they'll contact you about this book that you wrote many years ago. They'll very often know my, my books better than I do. I assume you don't pick them up once they're bound. Oh, no. In fact, once you're done, I feel like there's this happy sort of amnesia that <laughs> yeah, comes right. over you. And you just sort of, you're very happy right. to, to walk away from it while, while you're working on it. You, you can't stop thinking about it and you can't stop fiddling with it. You just, you can't stay away from it. So I don't know if it's just burnout on each project or if this is just the natural cycle to, to forget it and move on to the next thing. That's yeah. why a book tour is funny too because you're constantly called upon to talk about this project that, that is the last one. And project. you're already thinking about yeah. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the next one. Absolutely. Yeah. Even now, I, I love doing this. I love touring. I love meeting readers and yet, Part of me wants to be back at my desk and, and get back to the real work of what I do. I'd like you to finish the sentence for me. <laughs> Uh-oh. You ready? I don't know. If writing has taught me anything, it has taught me what? It has taught me not to compromise. It's oh. taught me to follow my heart, do what you're passionate about, and aim high. I would rather fail aiming high than settle for an ordinary life, an ordinary work. My goal is to, to write immortal books every single time. And I know I will fail, it's an impossible goal, but I want to spend the next 30 or 40 years wearing myself out after that goal.